Hello and welcome back to another episode of Craven Some Raven. And uh, in this episode, I'm going to be breaking down uh, the game that we just had versus the Steelers. Obviously, <clears throat> super close. We won in overtime, so good to get the W. Yeah, I know it was ugly. And it seems like across Ravens Nation, you know, watching some YouTubers do their reactions and then people in the comments, the sky is falling. Uh, I don't, I don't get it i understand why i mean it wasn't a pretty win but i'll take the win like can we can we think about just the w for a sec can we can we put the positives on it because it's like we won and instantly everything's negative about what went down in that game and i got i got some different opinions i think it was i think it was more positive than we think you know the the defense is playing terrible Honestly, watching that game a second time, I literally just watched it through. It's still fresh in my mind. The defense played really well. Uh, every single point that they got was off of some kind of crazy what call? You know, like a, like that first, first of all, that interception. That was not an interception where Burfick got it and the ground helped him complete the catch, which... I, what is the point of a goddamn replay if you can't get it right? I was talking to uh, Coach Evans, uh, Sip to Tally Films. You know, he records after each and every game, and I usually get on with him live, uh, call in, kind of like a co-host situation. But we we were talking about it, and I'm trying to explain. Like, I don't I don't fucking understand the point of the goddamn replay. What's the point of having penalties? You know, it just disrupts the flow of the game so much to the point where it makes it unwatchable. At certain points in that game, the refs were just throwing flags out for no goddamn reason. So, like, after Mason Rudolph, he gets he gets knocked out. Knocked the fuck out. And I get it. You got to say, hey, well, you know, prayers up for him. He's going to be fine. He is fine, right? He got hit in the head. He got concussed. He got knocked out. He's going to be fine. So with that being said, you got knocked the fuck out, bitch. How's that feel? And it wasn't intentional. It wasn't a, a mean-spirited play. There was no uh, mal content. I don't know the correct word. He he didn't. Uh, Earl Thomas did not do it on purpose. And the refs they see him laying there knocked out. So like, well, well, I guess we got to. Uh, we got to throw the flag, you know, he's knocked out, definitely wasn't on purpose, but you know, that's an iffy call, but we'll take it, he got knocked out, I understand why they make the call, uh, I don't even know, understand how he got knocked out, he didn't get, like, I remember watching the play live, and it was like, ooh, he got hit, but then, like, watching it in replay, I don't know, it was something, he was, when they showed it in slow-mo, he, like, had his mouth open, so I think that's some sort of, something with the jaw, you know, you get tapped on the jaw, Especially if it's open, it kind of creates more of a fulcrum or something. I don't really know the science or the physics behind it, but it was, uh, yeah, it, for him being asleep for so long, it seemed like he would have gotten hit harder. It didn't really make sense. But then later on in that drive, we stop him on third down. Uh, their wide receiver uh, got his hands on the ball. It was bobbling, bobbling. And then Maurice Kennedy knocked it out, and it went out of bounds. And on the field, they called it a catch. And so it's like, all right, whatever. You know, it was a it was a bing bang kind of play. Let's watch the replay so we can get this right. You watch the replay. Okay, yeah, no, he didn't have control of the ball before it got knocked out. He didn't get two steps before it got knocked out. That is an incomplete pass. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But wait. The refs still got to make the right decision. They got to make the right call. And they get it in slow-mo. They see the fucking play and say, no, 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 that was a catch. Are you kidding me? I, the whole, the, during the whole game, their, I don't know if it was Gene Steratore, I don't know, their, their guy in the box, their, their professional referee, ex-referee, the guy that they got on the sideline to say, hey, this is where I think this is going to go. This is the way they should call this. And, uh, kind of give you a view of inside the mind of a ref in each and every situation and they're they're usually right uh damn near 100 percent of the time because they were refs they understand the calls and they get to see it more than the refs do i don't know they're either seeing it from uh hey i gotta make this call right or everyone's gonna be pissed at me kind of situation 
and he disagreed with the refs all game, you know, when it came to the challenges that the Ravens threw. There was one challenge earlier, I think, uh, John Harbaugh challenged the ruling of a fumble because the, the Steelers were driving, and I think it might have been part of that drive, or it was a different drive, and I forget, I think Peanut came up with the ball at the end, and he just threw the flag because the players were like, hey, the, you know, he fumbled, he fumbled. And you should never listen to the players. Just go by the replay, and obviously he should not have challenged that. Uh, I think his players got in his own head on that one. So I thought that was a little bit bullshit. But then the other challenge, there was, what was, I think it was that play that I'm talking about, that I was just talking about, where the guy, he didn't catch the ball. He did not do all the necessary requirements to have a completed pass. He did not get a football move in after um, after he had possession of the ball because the ball was bobbling too much. So from him bobbling it to getting the ball punched out, it was not a completed catch. And I think everyone in their right mind, everyone across the league would agree with that. And so John Harbaugh has to challenge it. He's like, you guys got the call wrong. Let's Let's re let's replay it. Let's rewatch this. I know you'll get this right. And they end up getting it wrong. And John Harbaugh's on the sidelines saying, "This is a joke. This is a joke." He kept, he said the word "joke" I think five times. You know, during the replay. Like, are you kidding me? Because it that is what is the goddamn point? Okay. At you know at this point, let's fucking let's just go no refs. You know, call your own penalties. All right. I'm tired of these yellow flags coming out on such bullshit calls. You now you want them to get it right. You know, you want the game to be fair. But if it's gonna stop the play and you're still gonna get it wrong, fuck it. Let's go no rules. Let's see what happens. I'm goddamn tired of it. Or you know, just go the other way. Put chips in everything. Put lasers on the field. I don't know, so you can track everything and get some drones up on the field and just have a flag on it that can shoot down a. I don't know. Because the, the human error is huge, you know, and that's kind of why the refs are there in the first place, right? Human error. You make a mistake. You know, you hold someone. You do this. You do that. I mean, it could be on purpose, but, you know, you you make a mistake on the football field, the ref catches it, hey, you can't do that, you got to play with inside, the, rule, inside the, the rules of the game. But they're getting it wrong, man. And they make all these goddamn rules. Uh, this year, you know, you're allowed to challenge pass interference. Great, awesome, there's no way this can go wrong. But then you see an obvious pass interference situation, which there was some more of that in the game. And I think calls went bad towards both teams. There was one, there was a, um, and I don't want to harp too much on the refs and, you know, blame, blame anything on the refs. I'm just, I'm just angry at the situation that the NFL has kind of put on itself by asking these refs to do too much, trying to make the game safer, and it backfiring on them. Because now with the replaying or reviewability, of a pass interference, it's it's a subjective penalty in the first place. So now you're going to slow it down and say, yeah, that's pass interference, or no, that's not. You know, with the reason the rule was created, because of that blatant pass interference call or whatever, whatever it was supposed to be, defensive pass interference uh, that happened in the NFC Championship game versus the Saints. In all honesty, I think if they replay that, they make that reviewable, and they actually review that play, I doubt they overturn it. They haven't overturned a single goddamn call all year um, where, where it was pass interference or where it was considered not pass interference and it should have been, and they challenged that. And they, I don't think they've overturned a single one of those. I think they've turned over where it was called pass interference and it really wasn't. I think they've overturned that, but they, they haven't created a penalty out of this. You know, they, through this whole thing, You'd expect there to be more of these penalties called. Either way, they're ju they're just getting it wrong, and it's a situation that the NFL has put on itself. And now they're probably gonna have to change some more shit. And it, and it's just super. I, I'm I'm not a fan, man. I am just not not a fan. So, getting off these refs, man. I'm sure I'll speak on the refs more because just during this game, there was just so many trash calls. And like I said, it went both ways. There was the roughing the passer on Lamar. There was 
at the beginning of the game there was a uh, like an offsides or neutral zone infraction and there was there was actually two neutral zone infractions during this game one on the ravens one on the steelers and both of them shouldn't have been called you know they moved they jumped but they didn't go into the neutral zone they didn't actually enter the neutral zone so it's like well what the hell's the goddamn point okay it's called a neutral zone we're both allowed to be there right I mean, come on, the penalty doesn't make sense just on principle. <laughs> but, uh, you know, getting more to the play on the field. Um, this offense, it's one of the better offenses we've ever had. And something strange about it that I've noticed is either we get a three and out and we're off the field, or we have the ability to drive down the entire field. There's no in-between. There's no we drive 30 yards and then get stopped. You know, if no penalties involved, no kind of iffy, iffy kind of like, what? You're going to call that? Because they, there were a lot of those on offense too. And God damn it, I'm, I don't want to keep talking about it, but it kind of just, it, it, is, it is what it is, man. I, I don't know what else to say. Um, try, I'm trying not to, but it's impossible to talk about NFL in – 2019 and not talk about these refs they're worse than they used to be i don't know how they've managed that but they've somehow gotten worse is that their fault is there more pressure on them to make calls you know they're calling everything but you know what that's not what i'm talking about the offense <laughs> god damn it so this offense we can drive down the entire field and we either drive down the whole field or we get a three and out there's no in between. I I haven't seen it this year. Now maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, but just you know, like ten thousand view kind of look at this offense so far. They either move the ball and go down the whole field, or they don't. Now why is that? I don't know. Uh, it seems the drives that get stopped right away. Uh, it's usually a run up the middle, gets gets stopped, then they try to pass it over the middle. There's an incomplete pass. Uh, wide receivers can't get it, get it going. And I don't know. But the, the drives that are successful, so what I want to point out is Lamar runs the ball. Because off the heels of Lamar running, it opens up everything. When there's defenders that have to watch for Lamar, it opens, it opens so much up. And a lot of the talk is he needs to run less. He needs to run less. And I'm here to tell you, I think he should be running more. I think he's proven that he knows how to not take a huge hit, knows how to make it a glancing blow, and he is just our, our most skilled player on the team. Now, I get it. He's the quarterback, and you could say that about most quarterbacks on most teams, but if you're talking just athletics, running the ball, he's the best we got, and we need to run him more. You risk injury, you can't play scared, right? Are, do you get nervous when you see him run? I honestly don't. Because even when he gets hit, it's he, he, he doesn't really get hit. Like, I don't know. It's always a glancing blow that gets him. And very rarely, I don't know. He gets hit harder when he's getting sacked, okay? And, and yesterday, he didn't have the best game. He, he had, by far, I think he, it was his worst game, even considering that uh, playoff game versus the Chargers. I think statistically at least that was his worst game play wise you know I, I i wouldn't say play wise it was his worst game but if you're talking stats then yes and obviously stats don't tell the whole story because if you were to watch that playoff game versus this game you would say this game was better and he had three interceptions one of those not an interception uh but you know refs refs be damned they turned that into an interception um like, if it, if it wasn't called the interception on the field, there's no way they could have overturned that. It's, it's so dumb. God damn it. But there is another interception that was pass interference on Mark Andrews. The guy got there early, and it's clear and obvious that he got there early. But no, that ain't no goddamn call. Um, and apparently, like, Harbaugh was talking about it. They were asking him, why didn't you challenge that as pass interference? And I guess it's because... Um, since it was a turnover play, they automatically overlook it. And when they overlook the play, they also look at the pass interference. 
I don't know if that's actually true, but apparently they do. And apparently they thought he wasn't there early, even though he 100% was. Like, are they watching different games? Uh, are they When they slow it down, do they see something different than I do? Do I, do I need to have my glasses on? Do I need to have my eyes checked for false football? I don't know, whatever. Because it, it, it seems like we're looking at different things. Like, our timing is off. Like, I see it. He's there before the football is. The refs look at it and say... Nah. Mm, nah. We were right the first time. Like, get over yourselves and make the right goddamn call. Because you're pissing everyone off. Every single NFL fan. It, it makes it so impossible to watch. But that interception, you know, you can't, can't blame Lamar on two of those interceptions. The other one, he was throwing it to the sideline, trying to make... I don't even know why, because there's only 30 seconds left, and we would have had to drive down the entire field... It was a dumb, dumb play by Lamar Jackson to even attempt that pass in the first place, let alone the fact that he didn't see that guy falling off. So even if he would have gotten the completed pass, it, was, it would have been like a, okay, well, what was the point of that? There's like 30 seconds left, and we got to go 80 yards down the field. Why are you throwing like a five-yard out? And he didn't feel the guy drop off, and so that was an interception on Lamar. The other two, throw it up and let your guy get it. Um, I'd much rather Lamar do that than not you know i i really i'd like to see lamar throw it up let his guys get get it you know and lamar his his passes this game they weren't terrible there was only a few of them i was like oh man just missed them you know um there was the one to seth roberts that could have gone deep for the touchdown and if he just threw it a little bit more inside that would have been a touchdown seth roberts had his guy beat and that would have been a touchdown for sure because he, he had the step on him, and he just threw it too far out of bounds. Um, there is another play, I'm trying to think throw-wise, where Lamar just missed his guy. Yeah, I, I know there I know there were a couple. I, I just had one in my mind, but I, I forgot already. <laughs> so, yeah, he played better than his stats show, um, but I'm, I'm in the camp run Lamar more. And I understand you don't want your running back to be the lead rusher, but we we would have success running and we would have drives where the run was a success. And the reason was Lamar was running. Um, when our run game wasn't really working in that game, you know, we'd go through a series where the run just wasn't really uh, doing it for us, but the pass was and we could still drive the ball. The, you know, the times when the run wasn't working is when we weren't running Lamar during that drive. And it's anytime Lamar gets the ball, it oh, it feels like it's a free, a free five to ten yard play. You understand? You don't want your quarterback taking hits, right? But I think Lamar has changed the game, and I feel like he's changed his game due to what everyone else is kind of saying around him. Now he doesn't take the big shots like he did in college, which is awesome, which is great. But it, sometimes it feels like he's trying to prove everybody that he is a passer of the football. Because it seems like he trusts the pocket too much. He trusts our O-line too much. There's guys that go around him, and he feels like he can just nestle in there and continue to throw the ball. But when his reads aren't there, his guys aren't open, or he just decides not to throw it, which is a whole other thing. Like, is he making the right decision? You know, who knows? That's when you got to really break down the game tape. But when there's guys crashing in around him, uh, sometimes it, it's too late to where he tries to spin out of one guy and just runs into another. Uh, he, I feel like he's too comfortable in the pocket. You know, the first when someone gets by him, yeah, you know, I, I just wishes he, he could run up and move the pocket. When he, when he just stands there, uh, he's keeping the pocket in the same place, and our guys can't quite hold up. And he, he just trusts his guys a little bit too much. You know, it's like your negative is a positive. You know, he's such a good guy. He trusts his guy too much. You know, what are your greatest weaknesses? Now, I've talked about this before where sometimes it's, it's like the interview process where, uh, what's one of your greatest weaknesses? Well, you know, I trust my, my people too much. Oh, uh, well, that can also be seen as a positive because it can, you know. And he, I, I just think uh, I would like him to trust himself more. Because we've seen what he can do behind an even worse offensive line. You know, when he's playing at Louisville. I want to see him move the pocket more. I want to see maybe Greg Roman uh, design some rollout passes more. Uh, use that 
more frequently than he already is. Because it, it seems like every single time, you know, the, the defender, they run that arc, right? You know, they, they start running that arc and kind of get behind Lamar Jackson. Once they get past him, I want to see him cut up underneath them and move the pocket, you know, and then that's when plays open up and that's when you get such great highlight level plays from a Lamar Jackson type guy. Um, you know, that because you can't, you can't cover your guy uh, every single play, right? You can't cover the wide receiver for I don't know how many seconds, right? So you, they're gonna, the defense is going to have struggles. Or the opposing defense is going to have struggles when, if Lamar kind of does that. And I think he's just standing in the pocket because he trusts his guys and because he's trying to prove that I'm a goddamn quarterback. You know, I don't care anymore, all right? I'm done with that argument. I feel like everyone's done with that argument. I'm not really hearing it anymore besides a few people on FS1 because of the Fox Sports Network, and they, they have to say bold things because that's what Fox does. Well, here at Fox, we stay stupid and crazy shit. This is what we do. <laughs> you know, welcome to Fox. Can I take your order? Yeah, let me get a shit take and a, uh, a side of trash. Oh, uh, yeah, that'll be uh, 350 Oh, uh, yeah, no problem. Anyways, it's, it's just what they do. I don't, I don't think that is a, a thing that, that goes on anymore. Any NFL fan, anybody who covers the game with any sort of relevance or somewhat knowledge... Um, knows that Lamar Jackson's a quarterback, and he has the ability to do it different than anybody else does. And so, statistically, this game wasn't his best, but he still played good, and I want him to play his game, not be forced by what other people say. And sometimes it seems a little bit of that. Um, move the pocket, right? Move the pocket. And like I said, unpopular opinion, run more. I mean, he's so goddamn good at it. It's what... It's what is making our offense so great. I understand Greg Roman, he was a great addition this year. You know, he's done this with a Lamar Jackson. But sometimes the play breaks down, you know. It's never perfect. You can call a great game, but you still got to execute it, right? And the execution, when things break down, what Lamar can do is special, okay? It is very, very special. Uh, that's why I have... I've talked about MVP, Hall of Fame, all this other crazy stuff, you know. He's he's Mike Vick, but with a good attitude and doesn't fight dogs. You know, maybe he's got some sort of like squirrel fighting ring that we don't know about and we'll find out and he'll get he'll go to jail for fighting squirrels. I just or hamsters. I don't know. I I imagine it'd be some kind of small rodent. I don't know why, <laughs> but if if he was doing that, I feel like it would be squirrels. I don't know why. But uh but, you know, because Michael Vick, he'd be a Hall of Famer if it wasn't for that dog shit. For that dog shit. But uh, I, I think Lamar, he is a good guy. We we saw that when there was that rough in the passer, you know, a late hit out of bounds. Lamar ran into that girl uh, on the sideline, and she was like some kind of photographer, I think, or something. She had a camera. Ran into her, you know, he was getting up, got up quicker when he saw that he had hit her. Uh, helped her up, you know, rubbed the back of her head. It was a beautiful moment. Like, that's my quarterback. A good dude moment. That You know, if they, on Good Morning Football, they always do these crazy lists. They do, like, angry runs and toe drag swag. They should do a good guy moment of the week. I think that that would be a good segment. I think Lamar would win, You're right? You accidentally run into someone on the sideline. He picks her up, pat on the back. Hey, sorry, kiddo. And she's like, thank you, Mr. Lamar. Get on back out there. Win this one for Johnny. I don't know. It's just, he, he's a good dude. Uh, he's a good guy. You want, you want a Lamar Jackson on your team. He is a leader on many different levels. You know, kind, compassion, humble. Just like, a, it seems like a perfect all-around guy. So I'm glad he's doing, he's, he's that, that sort of way and he's leading our team. But uh, more on the offense. I, I'll get to the defense. I definitely have opinions on the defense. I just want to focus on the offense as of right now. Um, so we have a we have a good offense, and we were either we the only reason we didn't score are either because of an interception or a three and out. Nothing else stopped us. We can move the goddamn ball. And Pittsburgh, they have a pretty good defense. Uh, I was talking with coach about this. You know, after that, they. The Steelers' defensive line and linebackers is top top 10, top 5. 
Uh, when you talk about defensive line play, that's they're, they're really good. And when you talk about the Steelers' defense not being good, it's always with the secondary. They're not known for the secondary, right? It's, but their, their D-line and their linebackers have always been good throughout history. You know, it doesn't matter who's playing there. They've always produced, and they play pre- pretty good. Um, so when we were running the ball, you know, we had the success when Lamar Jackson was running, and that opened up everything for the running backs. And when it wasn't working, it wasn't working. It's because there, there was no threat with Lamar, what it seemed like. You know, they, they just went straight to the, the Steelers' defense, went straight to the point of attack. Like, I, we know this ball is going here. That's what it seemed like because it seemed like they went straight to that spot straight where the ball was going. And one thing about the running game, it's I understand we got to play Mark Ingram because he's the one making the money. He is the the older gent and he is the the leader in the room. But if you ask me, Gus Edwards is playing better. Um he just doesn't get enough touches. Uh maybe you know, my hope is that the Ravens are just saving him for when it gets colder, when it gets more important, then do a little bit more of a split. You know, use Mark Ingram now. Uh, you know, get him hyped, get him excited on the team. You know, maybe it's one of those you got to deal with the personalities. So get him involved early, get him excited, like, hey, you made the right decision coming here. And then later on in the year, when it gets colder, when it gets tougher, this is when we start using Gus Edwards and um, Justice Hill a little bit more. You know, and I like I like what Justice Hill did. He had that great run back. You know, obviously this there was just a huge hole. So if he didn't have a good run back, it's all right. Come on, and he ended up getting tackled by the by the kicker. So come on, man, you got tackled by the kicker. You're a running back, damn it. Got some speed. You know, just got tripped up there. But you know, it was still a good run back. But I like Gus Edwards and Justice Hill maybe a little bit more than Ingram. Um, I, I've, I've I doubt I'm the only one who feels this way. But the, I just think Gus Edwards, the way he runs, that straightforward, bulldozing, I ain't stopping for nobody. That sort of uh, style of running back just works well with the slashing and dashing of a Lamar Jackson. Uh, he just hits the hole hard, you know, and if it's not there, he's not really patient enough to wait and then hit the hole. And so, you know, you have that, that trade-off. But... I feel like Gus Edwards is a better runner. I, you know, maybe not pure runner, but he just hits the hole harder, and his style just meshes well with the Ravens' style. He just seems to me that he plays better, he plays stronger, he plays faster. I just like what I see from him, and I and I want the Ravens to run him more. Now, like I said before, you know, maybe they're waiting on that, waiting for it to get a little bit cold. But hey, man. It's fall. This is October. This is the Ravens month, right? The Ravens have always been good in October. Always. Um, now, I think November, that's when they have their lull, right? If I'm not mistaken, they go through a November slump. That's what it seems like. You know, they start off September and October, playing well. And then November comes and it's like, oh, shit. We suck. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of people... A lot of Ravens fans. This is this was an ugly game. We're not going to do shit the rest of the year. We can't play like this and win games. And I think most of that talk comes on talking about the defense. So let's let's go over there. But mind you, I do not share that same opinion of the sky falling. I still think this is one of the better teams in the NFL, even with all of our injuries. And you can't blame the injuries, next man up, and all that. All that fun stuff, we'll, we'll get to Tony Jefferson. Um, but like I said earlier, I think this defense played better than what people are thinking. Obviously, you let up points late. You let up points in general, you know, 23 points. You're not going to be happy, especially as a Ravens fan. The sky is falling. But I got some encouragement. I, I saw some things that encouraged me. Obviously, the pass rush needs 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 to improve um that is without question you know the blitzes didn't even really work we need to get to them a little bit more i think we got two sacks one of them was called back uh due to you know some kind of bullshit call that they didn't even show the replay on but uh it probably wasn't bullshit they probably got the call right but you know what it always happens that way you know you get a stop on third down 
or you get an interception, or you get a sack, and then there's a goddamn penalty. And it seemed like uh, anytime we did something good uh, versus the the Steelers' defense, we would always or Steelers' offense, we would get those goddamn penalties. When it came the other way, like with our offense, anytime, uh, anytime, like I guess the Steelers' defense would do something good versus the Ravens offense, there were no penalties. So it's so it's like if I hear the Steelers fans, you know, blaming the refs for that loss, you yeah, go ahead and check the tape. Watch that game again there, buddy. Tally up how many they got wrong for us and how many they got wrong for you guys. And then also take, take into account when those penalties were called, what happened on the field uh, after or during that penalty. You know, who... <clears throat> who got more taken away from the flags? And I just feel, you know, we didn't get as many flags, but more was taken away from us with those flags. So, Andy Steelers fan, talking, talking that, talking that smack, talking that stupid shit. You can go ahead and uh, go fuck yourself, okay? Before I Mason Rudolph your ass, <laughs> got knocked the fuck up. Yeah, man, he was asleep. Yeah, there was. So, uh, some players. On defense, that can encourage you, get you hyped, that'll make you craving some Raven, okay? That'll have you craving some Raven is a better way to put that. Um, Marlon Humphrey is the best cornerback in the league. Bold statement, I know Stephon Gilmore is doing great stuff, the McCourty bros, um, basically any secondary player on the Patriots defense. Uh, Jalen Ramsey, but he's not playing right now, and we should still trade for him. But I think I, I like what I saw from Jair Alexander too. Um, but I think Marlon Humphrey is the number one guy out of all of those players. I'd rather have him on my team. Those players that are listed, and it's because it's tough to catch a ball on him. It's going to take some sort of pick, pick play, which happened during that game. That touchdown to Juju Smith-Schuster. That's what happened. Um, but even if they catch the ball, you got to watch. You got to watch for fumbles, man, because Marlon Humphrey, the fruit punch man himself, isn't that his Instagram or something? Oh, shit. Um, because, man, he punch man, punch man, punch man, punch man, punch man, punch man. Like, are you kidding me? The f- fruit punch is like, oh, yeah. He nails the ball every time. He goes for it every time, anytime someone catches the ball. And this isn't the first forced fumble or forced incomplete knockdown type situation after the guy gets the ball. The dude just throws hammers down, and he is one of the best in the NFL, not only with his coverage skills, but also getting the ball out at the end of the catch. And that is something your defense can hang its hat on. Now, we need another lockdown corner. You know, we the pass rush has always been an issue, right? Even last year, I would say, uh, the reason it was good is because we could blitz more. And the reason we could blitz more is because we could go one-on-one on the outside. Well, we could still go one-on-one with Marlon Humphrey, but sometimes with Brandon Carr or with Maurice Kennedy, uh, we can't really lock them down. You know, We can't send extra guys in the box. We need some extra guys. Um, uh, what was I going to say just now? I've been going straight for 33 minutes, so you can you can expect something like this. You know, I've been talking straight. I I know me some Ravens I'm excited about them, so I can just speak on them. But some other encouraging things, not just Marlon Humphrey, because obviously with that punch out at the end, he won us that game. He really did. Great players make great plays at great moments, and that was one of those moments um, in overtime. So, yeah, when was the last time we won a game in overtime, right? It seems... You know, maybe I'm just remembering things wrong, but it seems like any time we'd go to overtime, we'd lose one, you know? At least recently. I I could just be, you know, seeing things wrong, but that's what it seems like to me. But another encouraging thing on defense is in the secondary as well. Maurice Kennedy, he played really well. Uh, And I know a lot of the talk with our secondary, you know, having the injuries and not looking good and, you know... Anthony Averett wasn't even active this game. The injuries, they are piling up. But Maurice Kennedy played well. Uh, he got a few balls caught on, but that's, that's the NFL, man. You, you can't stop everything. It's rare. It's, you can't have Marlon Humphrey at every position. Wish we could. Wish we could just kind of, like, clone him and put him at every 
different position, you know, have him whiff, lift weights differently. Honestly, I think Marlon Humphrey probably could play defensive line right now. The dude's a stud all, on all levels. But um, either way, he's Maurice Kennedy was in tight coverage all game. I think he even led the team in tackles, which you never want to see. But they were running to the outside a lot, so he had to come in and make tackles, you know, played in the nickel a lot. And anytime they'd have a run, he was there to make the tackle. He was a safety valve kind of in that sort of way. But he played very well this this game. Even Brandon Carr, he played pretty well. There was that, that phantom uh, pass interference that he got where he literally didn't even touch the guy. I think he, like, bumped into him. But that's because that guy stopped and tried to get hit, and he barely got hit. He was literally, I think he might have even had his hands behind his back or had his hands tucked in because he didn't want to grab him, <clears throat> didn't even want to touch him. And the ball was thrown way outside, uncatchable. And they fucking called that. Are you kidding me? But our, like, I'll keep repeating it. Our defense played better than what that score was. Okay? You watch the game again, and you'll see that each one of those scoring drives, I think maybe besides that, um, that, uh, the, the one where Lamar threw the interception, uh, deep in our territory. Uh, he threw that pick right at the end there, right before the end of the first half. You know, that that was that was the only scoring drive that they had that wasn't aided by some bullshit. And I think you could probably say the same thing about us, right? Our our offense was helped by penalties. But if you if you just look at a case by case basis, each one of those scoring drives, there was we had a stop or a turnover or Something we stopped them on a on a on a heavy down, right? On a third down, we would stop them, uh, stop a big play, and there would be a goddamn ridiculous fucking penalty. So you you can't you can't guarantee that the refs are going to call it the same each time, right? Because they've proven that the refs uh, will call different things with different ref groups, right? They they all have their personal opinions on what things should be. And you're not going to get those calls each and every time. And the Steelers, that's how they were able to score points, man. Help from the refs. Hometown. Right? I think the, I think the refs had some ketchup in their eyes, you know, some Heinz ketchup in their eyes because they, they were seeing red for us. I don't know. But uh, the defense played better than what people are th- thinking. You know, 20 points is, or 23 points is 23 points. But how did they get those 23 points? It wasn't by skill. Each one of those drives were stopped at one point. But due to some phantom bullshit, I'm just going to say the same thing over and over again. This podcast will be an hour of me saying that phrase. This is some bullshit, you know. But um, on the defensive line, right, that's that's our issue. That's where we're not getting enough pass rush. Um and I think we've never really, at least in recent history, it seems like just man-to-man, we're not getting a good pass rush. Um, not since Doomerville and Suggs that year, in my opinion. And I think that's because you know, the Ravens, they weren't, they're, not ask, they're not asking their defensive linemen to try and get upfield. Uh, they try to stack their man up first, close down the lanes first before they go and get the quarterback. And so you're already at a disadvantage in that aspect where you got you're asking your guys to do two things instead of one, right? You know, take care of the run first, then the pass. Even in obvious passing situations, they don't want the running back or the, I mean, the, the quarterback to run the ball, get through, and get find a lane. You know, don't get don't get too high on the arc. Don't don't let don't leave them in an open lane. And maybe that's just a personal opinion. Maybe I'm wrong in this, but that's that's how I feel. And um. And we need, we need people to step up, right? Tim Williams, he is not on the team anymore. You know, get the fuck out of here, bro. Even though I thought he was pretty decent, I guess he just wasn't producing enough. They didn't see stuff in practice. Maybe he was talking shit to somebody during practice and Harbs was like, all right, you, you're done. You ain't producing, you're talking shit. You're done. But, um, uh, what the fuck's his name? Sack Daddy. Um, Jalen Ferguson. <clears throat> I liked what I saw from him. Call me crazy, but I liked what I saw from him. 
Uh, the one play that I didn't like when I saw when I saw him on the field, you know, I I wasn't keying in on him, but when I happened to see him, uh, the one play that I didn't like was uh, he didn't set the edge on one play, and they got like a five yard run, but there was a penalty on it because he was being held, right? So there was a reason for that. But you know, he had the one move, right? The 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 push, the, the bull rush, right? That was his one move. But he's pretty good at it, man. He was getting good push on the left tackle of the Steelers. He was doing a good job. He was getting in the way of the quarterback, you know, making the quarterback feel his presence. Now, he didn't get home at all, but he was, he was disruptive, in my opinion. Um, I liked what I saw from him. So I think he's going to get some more playing time because Tyus Bowser was the opposite. He did not impress me. You know, he was not... I think getting in the way of the quarterback, but they used him more in coverage in dropping back, and I, uh, and I, I thought he looked good out there. You know, there was no passes caught on him. He found his spot, I guess, because the quarterback never threw his way. But they dropped him a lot, and I think that's what they, what that's what Tyus Bowser is good for, or good at. Not, this is what this is all you're good for, man. No, this that's what he's good at, right? Dropping back. That's what he did a lot at, in college at Houston. And he was very good at that, you know, being that two-way type of, you know, not so much edge rusher, but more of a, I guess, outside linebacker type where you are asked to go back in coverage. You know, that's what he's good at. Uh, so we got to use them. We got to use the people. We got to use the players for what they're good at. And Jalen Ferguson, he's great at converting speed to power, you know, coming off that edge real quick and just pushing up on the on the lineman to where they can't stop him. Um but, um, what was I going to say? Like, Matt Judon, he's kind of trailing off. I don't know. Like, he's just very streaky. Matt Judon is very streaky. And you never know when it's going to come, but he'll play good for, like, three downs out of nowhere, and then he'll, be, he'll disappear the rest of the game. That's just the way Judon is. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. Are we going to want to pay him? I'm not too sure. But, uh, um... Uh, who's Pernell McPhee, he also got involved. He's also very good. But, you know, we can't have him playing every single goddamn down. We need Jalen Ferguson to step up some more, even though I liked what I saw. You know, I think he can only improve from here. You know, he's getting some game action uh, under his belt, and I, I liked what I saw. It's very encouraging. I think we got a good guy. It's just he needs more time. That's really all it is. So each and every week, he's going to get better and better and better, and he's going to get more and more playing time. So we can have a rotation of these four guys, you know, obviously not the best, duh, but serviceable, you know. I think two weeks we lost, not serviceable. This past week, you know, not as serviceable. We just couldn't get back to the quarterback. But I saw some en encouraging signs. You know, the sky, for me, is not falling. And one play that I thought was interesting and maybe want to see a little bit more of uh, kind of a weird formation that the defense did, or a scheme that they did. It was down on the goal line. I think it was like a third and either third and goal or like a third and five. You know, real real close, like uh, maybe inside the ten, inside the fifteen. Uh, it was one of the plays where we held them up to a field goal because we stopped them on this down. You know, they came up to the line of scrimmage. People at the line of scrimmage. I don't think it was more than normal, but it, it looked like a normal looking defensive play. But everyone except for Pernell McPhee uh, dropped back, right? You know, there's, the end zone's there, so things are a little bit tighter. So, you know, in that sort of zone scheme where you drop 10, because the only one rushing the quarterback was Pernell McPhee. So you drop 10 into coverage. <laughs> I've, you know, I've never really noticed the Ravens ever do that. But it looked successful. It looked like around every single wide receiver, there was, there was like two, three guys. So it would have taken a miracle or an excellent play to even, to even get them, you know, to even uh, get a completed pass. So I really like that. I, and I think that that is an interesting kind of thing. If you know it's going to be a pass, drop everybody, right? Because the offensive line, they're stuck there. They, there's an invisible line, or not invisible, but there's a line that they are not allowed to cross. You know, when it's a passing play, they cannot cross that line of scrimmage, or, you know, they have a few yards, you know, of cushion or whatever. I'm not 100% sure on what the exact rule is, but 
that you get you turn like an 11 on 11 to like 10 on 5 you know you know how many people are rushing you know you got the running back you maybe have uh, a tight end, 11 personnel. So what is that? Four wide receivers. So you got you got you can have like a maximum of six guys going out for a pass, and you drop ten. So ten versus six. You do the math. It seems to make sense. And since we can't get there with the pass rush, right? You know, I I kind of like that prospect. Turn. Do ten versus six. Um, now, obviously, you're going to give the quarterback a lot of time, but Pernell McPhee, he's one of these guys where give him six seconds and he will eventually get to the quarterback. It doesn't matter who he's facing against. And on that play, you could see he was pushing the pocket. He was, he was causing havoc in, um, as just a one-man show. And so you think you pair that with other people, it'd be a different product. But no, I think he's just... Um, Kind of like a Mike Myers situation. He's gonna get to. He's gonna get the kill, right? But he's gonna walk there, and it's gonna take a while. But he gets the kill every time. I think that's Pernell McPhee. Um. But I I I kind of like that play. I thought it was interesting uh, where they used it, uh, when they used it, and I kind of like seeing it. I like well, anytime your coordinator can do something, you're like, wow, I've never. Didn't really think of it that way, you know? Or I'd like to see some more of that. You know, that, that's a good thing. Um, and just, and before I end this, um, I guess I guess talk some more defense. Um, Tony Jefferson, man, he is, he is now out for the year. Uh, he's out with an ACL, but John Harbaugh said that it could be worse. All Apparently, all his CLs got exploded. Um, <clears throat> on that play, he got injured. Uh, he buckled because he got injured and he ended up holding onto the tight end not on purpose it's just he fell and you know trying to break his fall that's what i think and we ended up getting an interception away from that play and of course there is a stupid fucking penalty right every goddamn time but you know what we're gonna be fine that tony jefferson all prayers up to you uh, I don't think it's season ending. You know, when Jimmy Smith goes out, it's like, oh, fuck. Here we go again. Tony Jefferson goes out. I know there's been a lot of controversy amongst Ravens fans. Is Tony Jefferson good? Should we cut him? Should all this, all that? Is his play worth it? I, I personally was a fan of Tony Jefferson. But when it comes down to a numbers game, I think the Ravens have like 30 safeties on the roster. You know, if you were going to lose a player in the secondary, it it would have had to be at safety. That's where we have our depth. Um, honestly, you know, how many cornerbacks we got out? You know, we got Jimmy Smith out. Uh, we got Tavon Young out. Uh, Anthony Averett wasn't playing for some reason. So that's three guys right there, right? If we had three injuries in the safety room, I feel like we would have been fine. Uh, because what what you miss in a player versus a cor- uh, a player in a safety versus a player in a cornerback it's you lose much more if you lose a cornerback right but a safety you just got to play smart and we have a lot of good safeties on this roster so it i'm not i'm not nervous i'm not happy about it obviously but i am not nervous i am not sad i am not upset uh that tony jefferson is now out because i believe it's going to be chuck clark that ends up taking over uh that's what people have been saying you know i don't really know i'd like to see the joker but apparently chuck clark's one of the smartest players and i i thought he played well last year when tony was out uh, i thought he played well in the preseason i thought chuck clark has just played well and then we still got anthony levine we still got the joker who for whatever reason seems to not want to get on the field like i don't know why the coaches aren't putting him on the field because it seems like every single ravens fan that i know are excited and hyped about the joker but yet he's never being put on the field. I don't know why, but uh, they he's killing it. Um, it looks like he's, he's good. I don't know. Uh, I'm seeing something different from from the coaches, maybe. Maybe he's doing stuff in practice that's like, what are you doing, bro? But uh, 
we just have a lot of depth at the safety position, so we will be fine, okay? We are going to be fine at the safety position, you know, even with the Tony Jefferson injury. But, you know, that, man, you know, Tony Jefferson, out. Jimmy Smith, out. Tavon Young, out. That is three quality players on our defense, leaders of the team, and they're out. You know, so you think the defense isn't playing as well as it should. Obviously, that's bad. But considering, we're fine. We're going to be okay. Now, do I have nerves about playing a really good team? Of course, and I would have anyways. But listen, as much as I want to see the Ravens go out and make all the trades for literally everybody who comes available, right? I still think the Jalen Ramsey, that would be a good football move where you wouldn't be destroying your future for that player. Um, maybe you won't have as many picks as you should, but um, he would be a future player. You know, he would be a player in your future. He would be in the plans. He would be a top-notch guy. I think, you know, him and Marlon Humphrey, whoo, that's a deadly combo. Bring in Jimmy Smith every once in a while. Oof, man. God, that's spicy. But as much as I want to see uh, the Ravens make all these trades for these players, you know, I, I would almost much rather see the Ravens get through this year, you know, do as much as you can, get as far as you can, play to your best ability, make the playoffs, lose in the playoffs, you know, at least win one game, get a win under Lamar Jackson's belt, get to the playoffs, win at least one game, and then go into the next year hyped about the prospects, hyped about what your team can do. You know, re-sign some of your own guys and then bring in a lot of draft picks, right? You know, just let the team be, let it be what it is, and then try to improve next year. You know, you want to try to win each and every year, but you can't risk your future too much, right? Now, you could dive into that even deeper, but just a little taste. Maybe maybe I'll do an episode about that, about how to build a team, you know? Or maybe that's more of an off-season type thing. Or I'll touch on it at some point. You know how these podcasts go. If you listen to it, you know it goes all over the rails. It goes all over the craziness. Because all over the craziness? What is? What does that even mean? Either way, I have definitely been talking for 52 minutes straight. 52 minutes and 21, 22, 23 seconds straight. So I did not pause this one once, actually. So that was awesome. I thought I would have had to go and grab some water at some point. But nah, bro. I'm a fucking pro. There's not as much emotion as there would have been yesterday, because yesterday it was more of like, oh, wow, this team is trash. I know we got the win, but this team is trash. But today, it's more, we got the win. There were some encouraging things. So, you know, it's crazy. I think that's literally all it was. You know, all that talk of, oh, the sky's falling, the team's terrible, we can't win any meaningful games if we play like this. Um, If... What, so we can't win any meaningful games if we can't play winning football? If we can't play enough to win? I mean, it sounds like you get the win every time, right? If you play well enough to get the win, sounds like a win, right? But um, I, I feel like later on in the week, everyone's emotions will kind of die down. That's why I like to do this one day after, get a chance to watch the game again, you know, get less emotion involved. But either way... Um, I am going to end this podcast. It is now almost 54 minutes. We're going to stay under the hour mark. I am tired of talking. I am hungry, so I will get some food. But thank you for listening. Uh, If you're on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. If you're on a podcasting app, you know, if you're listening on YouTube, I am on on like the podcasting apps, right? iTunes, Google Play, uh, Stitcher, Spotify. So I I will find you, right? <laughs> I will find you, and I will kill you. No. Um, so if you, if you want to just listen to it as a podcast, you don't want to get on YouTube, you know, you want to have the ability to lock your phone, put it in your pocket, listen to some great Ravens content, then you can go ahead and find me on a podcasting app or Spotify. So thank you for listening. Um, Ravens got another a close, close win in overtime. Marlo, Marlon Humphrey with the play of the game. 
Uh, I will talk to you guys probably in a couple days. We'll do my picks episode. Um, I'll do a review of the Bengals game. Uh, so, till next time, you Ravens. <laughs>